So let me begin with a very short introduction to this topic of today, which is scientific temper in the present context. And I want to underline in the present context. Because we have been discussing scientific temper since our people science movement started. Way back in 1981, uh, the first statement on scientific temper was brought out by uh, P. N. Huxer, uh, who is considered in many ways the modern father of scientific temper, uh, who felt that strongly that scientific temper was dwindling uh, in our country and that efforts needed to be made to revive scientific temper. And it was a glittering galaxy of scientists and a few social scientists. P. N. Hatsar, Pushpa Bhargava, uh, Raja Ramanna, and so many others signed that statement on scientific temper. A decade or more later, there was another statement on scientific temper uh, called the Palampur Declaration. Again, by many scientists, etc., seeking to update the earlier resolution. In those days, the bulk of the concern about scientific temper was, and which was articulated as such in 1981 in Huxer et al's uh, statement, that society was uh, plagued by superstition, by backwardness, and by a sense of helplessness in the face of socio-economic developments over which they had no control and which bred a tendency to what the statement called fatalism. This is going to happen anyway, it's going to happen, what can I do about it? And this, it was felt, was holding the country back. The 1991 uh, Palakur resolution also in some ways echoed this sentiment. So the major concern was the lack of scientific temper among the people. So a lot of the campaigns on scientific temper were how to inculcate knowledge about science and technology, improve science popularization, and a large number of our PSM organizations engaged in very widespread activities against superstition. Look, so and so, God man is saying, I will produce something from thin air and I will show you how this is uh, not correct and I will show you scientifically how this can be done. And by that process, uh, debunking uh, superstition. This was the major uh, issue. Theoretically, there were some problems with that formulation. I will come to that later, especially during question answer if we have time. But two problems, I think, stood out, which demarcate that phase from today. One is, as I said, we located the problem among the people. People did not have scientific temper. That was located in there. And if you see the famous Article 51AH uh, of the Constitution, which we all quote very often, in the directive principles also, it is the duty of every citizen of India. So again, where is the problem located among us? It is our duty to inculcate scientific temper. In all this, the duty of the state and the role of the state, the responsibility of the state was somewhere not focused or missed, if you like. Today, the problem is scientific temper is under attack, deliberate attack on scientific temper, not from among the people. People have no problem with scientific temper. But there is a deliberate attack by the ruling establishment and its allied social forces on scientific temper in many ways which my paper uh, outlines, which is why I am calling it 
a systemic problem today. Scientific temper is no longer a dialogue between you and me and the people. It has become a battle between the people and the ruling establishment and their allied social forces. That is the problem today. And I will start by analyzing some major developments which indicate how this uh, battle against scientific temper in our current context has unfolded uh, in the past close to 10 years or so. Very soon, uh, in 2014, 2015, after the new uh, powers that we took office, uh, we saw uh, programs being conducted on the sidelines of the Indian Science Congress, in which the Prime Minister himself inaugurates and acts as the patron uh, of that, or the entire scientific community of the country is present. There was an event on the sidelines of it, as well as speeches by major figures in the Science Congress, as well as outside in different functions, where in the sidelines of the Indian Science Congress, there were major presentations to say, as much as to say, look, the Science Congress is there. They are discussing all kinds of problems, but the real achievements of science we have already achieved in our great ancient past, 8,500 years ago or thereabouts. And these were achievements in ancient India and they recounted some of them. A spacecraft which could undertake interspace travel, interplanetary travel. There were spacecraft at that time. Then examples were given of Lord Ganesha. How does the elephant's head sit so perfectly on a human body? Because we had advanced cosmetic surgery technology at that time, which the world has not seen even till today. And stories about uh, how Kunti gave birth uh, through a process of immaculate conception, which proved that there must have been in vitro fertilization uh, in those days. And such statements were made on the platform of the Science Congress itself also. And when those many scientists wrote and protested about this, the reply that was given by ministers and leading figures was, all these people who are protesting have got colonized minds. They cannot accept that ancient India had all this knowledge. They think only Western society has science and that India could not have science. So those who are criticizing these statements are all anti-national uh, figures. So I don't want to get into the politics of this. But as a science activist and a people science activist, two problems strike me immediately there. One is, these statements about ancient Indian science, what it had or what it did not have. The question is, not just when we speak about this in general conversation, people smile and people laugh and say, look what uh, kind of claims there are. So one problem with that is, not just that they have made those statements, but for us the problem also is to talk to the people about why we think those statements are incorrect and what does it tell us. I think it tells us that, number one, there is no understanding of science being projected there. Ancient Indian science had many achievements uh, to its credit. Those achievements can be proved by scientific methods and by historically well-established techniques. Ancient Indian steel making, ancient India's contribution to mathematics and astronomy. There are proofs, palm leaf manuscripts, uh, books are available, uh, archaeological evidence, textual material, 
all these evidences are available. But is there any evidence to show that a interplanetary flight uh, object could exist? If there were, there should be some textual material to show some understanding of how does a body heavier than air fly. That's the fundamental principle of rockets or aerodynamics somewhere. In some Grantha, in some uh, Purana, in some Veda, there should be some uh, Sutra which tells you there is no textual evidence. Some archaeological evidence should be there for advanced materials, light materials, some material. There is none there. So, the question is not whether they are right or they are wrong. The question is, what is the evidence and how do you judge whether it is right or it is wrong? And that is where science, the scientific method and the scientific temper uh, comes in. We are arguing not only against why it is wrong, but we are arguing about how do we know that it is wrong. What is the scientific method by which you make this claim? That the claim, therefore we say, the claim itself is non-scientific. But the attack that claim came was not of you prove or you disprove. Many of the ministers of those days used to say, I have made the statement, now you go ahead and disprove it. So I was on television in one of these uh, shows and somebody made a statement like that and said, this is what I believe, now you disprove it. I said, I'm sorry, that is not a scientist's job. That anybody passing on the street makes any claim and then I spent 20 years of research trying to disprove you. If somebody comes and says, I have found a magnet with only one pole, what am I supposed to do? I'm supposed to investigate that in my laboratory. Huh? There must be some basis, some foundation, some prior knowledge. Uh, that is not how science works. But the opposition to that was, no, we have said this, what we are saying is correct, we believe it is uh, true, if you don't agree with it, you disprove it. But more than that, we say that if you disprove, then you are anti-national. And this argument is not confined to the science. We saw that during that period, there were large instances of flouting of academic freedom in Jawaharlal Nehru University, Central University of Hyderabad, IIT Madras, IIT Mumbai. Lectures by prominent historians were not allowed. Somebody would be called, then there will be a big mob coming outside and saying, no, this fellow is anti-national, you should not listen to them, drive them out. That opinion cannot be heard because that is an anti-national. So, the problem became not only that there were non-science opinions or pseudo-science opinions, but also that arguments against that were not dealt with rationally or by any scientific methods, but by labeling you anti-national, therefore curbing dissent. Now that is our second major problem as people science activists with the notion of scientific temperance. Dissenting opinion. Differing opinion, pluralism of opinion is central to the development of science. Without pluralism, without differing opinions, science will not develop. If everybody had agreed with Aristotle that the whole world and the cosmos was spherical and that the earth was at the center of the universe, science would not have developed. Somebody started questioning. Copernicus put forward a model, but somebody started questioning that. There were differing opinions. Then Kepler's model emerged. Science develops through questioning, through differing opinions, through pluralism. So pluralism and diversity of opinion is vital to the development of science and therefore vital to scientific temper. So cornerstone of scientific temper is the existence of pluralism, duality of opinions, and the opportunity for critical thinking. That is more important than knowledge of science. Knowledge of science, many scientists have. 
chairman of isro also has knowledge of science but it does not prevent him from saying that uh, india had great science and mathematics uh, in the earlier times which was stolen by western countries and taken away uh, from us so knowledge of science itself is no guarantee about scientific temper scientific temper requires the existence of critical thinking and plural opinion that is a central point for scientific temper which is i think should be a cornerstone of our work in spreading scientific temper is not just popularization of science but encouraging critical thinking and uh, pluralism we also see that the other feature of the attack as i have described it on scientific temper is that we say like we had argued about the spacecraft and all that the crucial point there is evidence based reasoning if you are making an argument give evidence for that some evidence must be there if i say you are wrong i give evidence uh, to say you are uh, wrong so the the other critical aspect of scientific temper is evidence based reasoning today unfortunately if you look at this government's record it is that they even well uh, falsify evidence they deny uh, evidence they even manufacture evidence there are at least 19 reports of the government prepared by government agencies themselves which the government has not allowed to be released saying no we disagree with the methodology here yeah, so we won data on hunger in india we have recently seen the latest report on hunger index where india is ranked 116 uh, in the world and rank is going down every year government says no we reject this data it is based on wrong methodology what is the wrong methodology what is the methodology they use against the methodology you use denied their own data denied how many deaths took place during covid because of covid we don't know how many deaths took place because of oxygen uh, deprivation we don't know so either you have no data or whatever data is there you don't agree with it demonetization was supposed to be for eradication of black money data came out that all the cash that was believed to be in circulation had come back into the reserve bank so if all the cash has come back into the reserve bank where is the black money we don't know so the question is if evidence based reasoning itself collapses either it's because your reasoning is wrong or because you say there is no evidence you deny the evidence if you don't have evidence based reasoning how can you have scientific temper how can you have evidence based or research based decision making evidence based planning in governance you don't have that this is the other major attack on the scientific temper we used to have arguments with government earlier in so many occasions and the arguments used to be you are saying this we are saying this because of this data or this evidence today you have an establishment which says none of your arguments we are prepared to accept because we will tell you what the evidence is we will tell you what uh, i'll give you two examples which bring this out very clearly there is the big argument raised by the ruling forces of this country that there was in ancient times uh, the mythical or legendary river saraswati which is supposed to come from underground and merge with the ganga and the yamuna at uh, ilaba in prayag that river saraswati when it existed where it disappeared what ecological factors were there are unclear Uh, in history we don't know the answer to that their answer to that is our faith tells us that there was such a river and it is there and now what they are doing is you will be surprised to know they have diverted 
a river from Himachal Pradesh at the border of Haryana. They've created a small dam. They've impounded that water. They have created a canal passing through Haryana, through Yamuna Nagar, where they have allowed that water from Himachal to flow and they say, here, this is the river Saraswati. So after today, you no longer have to debate because they will take you on pilgrimage by rail yatra, by everything and show you one river which is flowing there and they will say, this is Saraswati and it is merging into the Yamuna here and then it will go and merge it. So this is now the next stage, which is manufacturing the evidence uh, itself. It is no longer claiming, it is no longer uh, okay. That's the other uh, part. The fourth part is, India today is standing at the cusp of what everyone calls the knowledge era. We call it the knowledge era because knowledge rules. Uh, we think technology uh, rules, new technology rules, but today if you actually look at the techno-economics of technology, it is the knowledge which is the main uh, controller of the and money behind the technology. All of you have cell phones, whichever company it is made by, made by Xiaomi, Oppo, any of the Chinese companies or made by Samsung or anything. Inside that, once I told my computer uh, supplier that I wanted to buy a laptop, because my old laptop had collapsed. And I said, I am disinclined to buy Chinese uh, laptops. Please tell me, recommend to me anything other than a Chinese laptop. He said, sir, why do you bother? Whichever laptop you buy, 80% of the components inside that are Chinese. So it doesn't matter what the brand outside uh, says. They are 80% Chinese anyway. But even more important, if you take Samsung, Samsung today is a Korean company. 80% of screens, whether it is on your laptop, whether it is on your phone, whether it is on your TV uh, at home, LED TVs, 80% of screens are made by Samsung everywhere. If you take manufacture of the chips inside your Samsung phone or Apple phone or whichever phone you have, 80% of those chips are made by one company, Foxconn in Taiwan, which is trying to set up a factory in India. They've got factories in China. They are the major chip manufacturer of the world. But do you know they don't own any technology? All the technology they use for manufacturing the chips are owned by two chip design and manufacturing companies in the United States. They are the people who are making the money. Apple Phones is one of the world's top five companies. They manufacture nothing. They don't make a single cell phone. It's all made by Foxconn. What does Apple own? They own the software. They own the uh, patent uh, behind those technologies. So that is why this is called knowledge era. Because manufacturing does not get you money. Even manufacturing high-tech product does not get you money. It's the knowledge that goes behind the product that has the uh, money. So that's why it's called the knowledge era. In that knowledge era, India's investment in R&D is continuously going down. We have always been poor at R&D expenditure. Today, it has gone below 1%. It is now 0.7% of GDP, roughly, compared to 2 to 3% of most countries in Southeast Asia, 5% in Korea, 5% in uh, China, and higher in other countries. With 0.7% is the total GDP, out of which much of it is by multinational companies, etc., etc. What knowledge are you going to create in this uh, country? You are dealing with the knowledge uh, era. Not much, because most of your industries in the country, even the manufacturing, are at the lowest end where you import components, as I said, from anywhere in the world and run a screwdriver and assemble the uh, machine. Any so called made in India cell phones should actually be called assembled in India 
cell phones. So that's all that you are uh, doing. In this knowledge era, this is what is happening. All R&D labs, universities, many of you will know, their funds are being slashed. Research funds are being uh, cut. But there are new schemes now coming from central government. Department of Science and Technology has a scheme, 100 crores per annum on cow products. You do research, all kinds of research on all kinds of products of the cow to show that cow has, the cow's pro products have these quasi-magical properties. This one research paper I have read which says that cow dung cakes are resistant to radioactivity and that is why in ancient times people put cow dung on their walls so that if somebody explodes an atom bomb their houses will be safe. This is one. There is another research uh, project I have seen where they have said that the ancient Indian uh, practice of incantation of mantra like Om, uh, everybody talks about the power of Dhvani, uh, of the sound. That has great power and they are running a test which they call a double blind uh, test in hospitals in Delhi where some cancer patients they will be lying there and they will play incantation of Om and in the other beds nothing and then they will study what is happening. The project unfortunately came to me for referee uh, comments. So I wrote back saying this is not a double blind trial. If you want to test you have one set of patients listening to Om, another set of patients listening to any other rhythmic sound. It can be anything. It may mean nothing, it can mean anything. It could be Kiri Eleso, it could be any, any incantation that you think of can be played. Any rhythmic sound may produce the same effect as playing of Om. That will be a real double blind trial, they did not accept that recommendation. They gave that person the money. To 100 crore is just for this. Then there are so many, there was a Gau Vigyan uh, exam being conducted. All those are there. So again, it is not just that these are fancy ideas. Look at them, they are saying these things about cow dung. But it is much more than that. They are undermining scientific method. Imagine young students brought up like this. They think this is science. Doing science is this. You think up of anything, you hear some guru saying something uh, happened and immediately that becomes science uh, to you. That is good enough. During COVID uh, period, we heard even our uh, Prime Minister told the people, come out on your balcony and clap. Uh, you light uh, lamps on your uh, balcony, you bang your uh, plates and uh, thalis and COVID will be defeated. And within two days, the troll army of uh, the ruling establishment said, look, we have got photographs and measurements from NASA who has said that the vibrations from these uh, and the lights emanating from these uh, lamps were so powerful that they spread this radiation which has reduced the amount of uh, impact that COVID has. Any evidence for reducing impact? No. Any other evidence for showing that NASA has obtained? No. But we believe that this is... So this idea, and this is why I keep coming back to scientific temper, it is not just somebody spreading some wrong information, but they are spreading it in such a way that it undermines scientific thinking, it undermines the spirit of inquiry, it undermines the idea of what is science, what does science mean. All these are uh, one by one what is uh, happening. So the latest of these examples is in the NCRT textbooks, which we I think all know about. They removed whole chapters in history. Uh, they have removed uh, whole sections. I have seen one calendar 
brought out by uh, these people who have traced various uh, big major events in history in India and given five pictures. Five pictures are of uh, Aurangzeb, Babar, uh, four or five uh, Mahmud Ghazni, like that, with a caption saying, these are invaders. So Indian history, as far as the establishment is concerned, ends with 1100 with Mahmud Ghazni, uh, etc. Funnily enough, they don't recognize any white-skinned invader who came into our country, ruled our country for 300 years. They are not considered invader over there. It is only the Ghaznis and the Babars and the Mughals who are considered. Anyway, that is one. The more. Just as important, if not more, which has not got so much press attention uh, in this, is the removal of uh, Darwin and evolution uh, theory, uh, the removal of Pythagoras uh, and that uh, thing from the NCRT textbook, and which has received even less attention from 6th standard to 12th standard. All sub chapters and in some cases even chapters dealing with India's natural resources dealing with forests, dealing with mineral resources, have all been removed. So now children growing up in this country will not know that forests are being destroyed, will not know that mines are being set up to rob the country and destroy the environment, will not understand that our ecosystem is being destroyed because of these so-called developmental activities. They just won't know because it is not there in their textbooks. And they will not understand evolution. And if you don't understand evolution, any school teacher of the sciences will tell you, you don't understand the natural world. And in fact, you don't understand human beings themselves, if you are not understanding uh, evolution. But the story goes even deeper. Uh, I was on TV, on NDTV, uh, fortunately, unfortunately, I am in Delhi. So whenever NDTV or somebody has a problem on science coming up on the TV, it's easy for them. Babu, sir, please come. And so, okay, I went there. Discussion was on NCERT textbooks and Darwin. So the NCERT boss was there. The previous NCERT boss was there. There were a couple of intellectuals from the ruling establishment and their social organization. They were all there. I was the only fellow from this side. So I was trying to figure out, they kept saying, no, you know, we changed Darwin because we removed that because COVID time was there. So we had to reduce the syllabus because less time was available. So we removed Darwin. There was no other. Uh, so I just happened to mention, I said, no, I think, you know, among the public, there is some doubt because Minister for Education, the Deputy Minister for Education in Parliament, has made a statement, and this is recorded in the Lok Sabha. He has made a statement saying, we, this was before the removal, he said, I believe Darwin's theory was wrong and it should be removed from NCRT textbooks. He made that statement uh, before. And he said, we have much better theory of evolution in our Dashavatara. That shows you evolution, how humans uh, evolved to the highest level of consciousness. That tells you what evolution is. And I can tell you, none of us have evolved from monkeys. I believe that my ancestors were rishis. And we have uh, come from rishis, not from monkey. Has anybody seen a human, a monkey becoming a human being? This was his answer. Once again, destroying all understanding of what is science and how you have arrived at evolutionary understanding, etc. And true to it, that was uh, removed from uh, the textbooks. And these people in that television program, unfortunately, were exposed. They could not say anything to which one of them actually replied saying, yes, Darwin was wrong. Darwin was wrong because he did not take into account mutation. He said, you know, I have a science background, so I am saying, Darwin was wrong because he did not take into account the mutation. 
So I said, look, please, you may be a scientist, but I'm sure you will understand science evolves and new understanding evolves and becomes part of that body of science. So discovery of mutation at its processes came 20 years after Darwin. Doesn't mean Darwin was wrong. Uh, Kepler came after Copernicus. It doesn't mean Copernicus was wrong in saying that the solar system went around uh, the sun. This is how science advances. Uh, so that was, but this shows that there is a consistent attempt to attack science and to posit an alternative, which is an alternative belief in ancient Indian science. And I would like to spend a few minutes on what is their alternative. As I said, they say ancient Indian science believes this. And please note, even though they use the phrase ancient Indian science, they are actually referring to ancient Vedic Sanskritic knowledge production. They don't take into account Jaina schools of thought, Buddhist uh, schools of thought, post-Vedic uh, schools of thought, no medieval science and technology. According to them, all medieval science and technology is invaders' technology, so it is not indigenous uh, technology at all. No account is given of sources from South India showing different modalities of knowledge creation, tribal India, Northeast India, all those don't count. Indian culture is being equated with a single unitary vision of what is Indian culture which is a Vedic, Sanskritic, and if I may be allowed to say, upper caste creation of what is uh, ancient Indian uh, knowledge. And this is not a figment of my imagination. They revised NCERT textbooks. The new education policy says exactly this. We will teach in our schools the foundation of ancient Indian science from Sanskrit shlokas and the Vedas. Very clearly mentioned. They don't mention any other source uh, of this thing. Vedas and Sanskrit uh, shlokas. Everything else is uh, uh, ignored uh, in that. This is a very conscious creation by people whose ideology is once again coming back to what I was saying about scientific temper. No pluralism. No diversity. Everything must be unitary, must be one. That is their idea. We know politically they are famous for one nation, one ration card, one nation, one election, one nation, one. So everything is one. It has to be no diversity. The same applies in knowledge uh, creation for them as well as in culture. It is well known that their ideological forefathers uh, have coined this phrase that what unifies India is what they call Hindi, Hindu, Hindustan. This is, this is what unites uh, India. And today you find bills being tabled in parliament with titles given only in, in Hindi. If you read those titles, you will not understand what that bill is uh, about. Because there is no English title and Hindi title at least to enable us to understand. It's gone. Hindi is now going to become more and more lingua franca. You will be surprised to know this latest controversy which has been going around started with uh, Udayanidhi uh, Stalin in uh, Tamil Nadu talking about uh, Sanatan Dharma uh, and this thing and there was an uproar uh, everywhere about it. I don't know how many of you are aware <coughs> The word Sanatan Dharma actually occurs in the Bhagavad Gita in a specific context when Krishna is delivering his uh, sermon to Arjuna, telling him to obey the eternal duties. So he was convincing Arjuna, your duty as a Kshatriya, as a warrior, is to engage in war. So don't develop doubts and conscience about it. That is Sanatana Dharma, eternal duty. The, there is no continuous self-recognition among Hindus 
of what is called Sanatan Dharma. Today, it is being made of Sanatan Dharma equals Hindu. So, if you say Sanatan Dharma, this is an attack on Hindu. I just four days ago came back from Haryana, and I don't know how many of you are aware of this, but in the 19th century and early 20th century, in northern India, particularly in Punjab, in Haryana, and the same big social division spread to where people from these northern states and from Bihar and East UP were settled abroad in South Africa, in Trinidad, in the Caribbean, etc. And that debate was starting with the Brahmo Samaj in Bengal, Raja Ramon Roy, the Ramakrishna uh, mission. The Ramakrishna mission actually went to court uh, and asked for a declaration that we are not Hindu. Please declare us as not Hindu because we don't accept uh, what people are describing themselves as Hindu. We are not subscribing to that. We also accept Jesus Christ as a uh, savior and etc. So we have our own uh, religion. We should not be called Hindu. The Brahmo Samaj later had its own versions of what was called Hindu. And I'm saying this because this monolithic idea of a Hinduism is also something which is uh, created. Uh, it is not something which is organic and uh, exists. So in northern India, in Punjab and Haryana, the movement led by Swami Dayanand Saraswati uh, was called Arya Samaj. So the whole chain of DAV schools, DAV colleges, uh, Dayanand Arya Vidyalaya, big social movement. They opposed idol worship and you'll be surprised to know they went to temple after temple in Punjab and Haryana breaking idols. So it's not Mahmud Ghazni who <laughs> did this only, it was Arya Smaj uh, which went and break, broke temples. They opposed idol worship and said we want to go back to original Vedic worship which is just with a yajna fire in front of us and Vedic mantras to be chanted, that's all, which is uh, this thing. So, they did not agree with this phraseology of Hindi, Hindu, Hindustan. On one ground, which will be surprising to you, all these three terms, they said, are not Bharatiya terminology. The words Hindi, Hindu and Hindustan, they are all either Persian or Arabic in origin. So they described themselves as Arya and there was then in counter to that the others called themselves Sanatan Dharma and this became a big battle which raged for 50 years in Punjab and Haryana, in South Africa, in Trinidad, there were actual physical uh, clashes between these two. I am saying this only to show that there is actually no monolithic construct of Hinduism. Today they are trying to create one, which is, as I said, Vedic, Sanskritic, upper caste. This is another very interesting example, again brings out this issue of the scientific temple and how it says, if you are putting forward, I don't have a problem if there are 10 different versions of Hinduism, it doesn't bother me uh, at all. It seems to bother them and I at least have evidence to show 10 different varieties of Hinduism in our country. I don't see why that should be a big problem uh, in their case. But it does become a problem in their case because they want this unitary idea. No pluralism, no diversity, etc. Even in the concept of Hinduism where this may not exist theologically, they are trying to convert into a political uh, statement of unity. Uh, and, the, and the most striking example of that there is a growing movement, particularly in North India. Every festival now has become a time when social forces proclaim, here's a festival, all meat shops should be closed. Navaratra used to be celebrated on two days. Now Navaratra is a full nine day festival. You have a Navaratri and you have a Navaratra. Two separate things. No meat should be done. They go around closing down all meat shops, arguing that this goes against Hindu sentiments. Anthropological Survey of India in 1998 has conducted and identified 88% of 
of communities in India are non-vegetarian. So Hindu India is not predominantly vegetarian. There is no predominantly vegetarian concept. You in Kerala would know that very well. I think you would find it quite difficult to locate vegetarians uh, in the state. Even more difficult in Bengal, uh, where Dhanarjis, Chatterjis, Mukhopadhyayas, all Brahmins, they all eat meat. Kashmir, all the Brahmins eat meat. And this is largely true in many parts of the country. In half the state of Bihar, it's what is called Mithila. In the, the Maithili Brahmins there, they're all meat and fish uh, eaters. So this idea of the vegetarian Hindu is again a myth being created. I'm making this point for two reasons. Where I started, one is the central concern both in scientific temper and in society at large of pluralism and diversity. Without diversity in society, there is no democracy. Without pluralism, there is no science. And I think that is where the two uh, converge. And the other important thing, going back to where I started on the earlier scientific temper resolutions was, I think there was one mistake made in the, both the scientific temper resolutions. And that is, those scientific temper resolutions did not include the social sciences. And I think that is a big mistake. And I think in contemporary uh, society, we need to include social sciences as part of our sciences. So when we say science, we mean not only the natural sciences, we mean the social sciences also. Today, the attack which is coming on science is not only against scientists. In fact, the attack started first on the social scientists. It started on history, it started on Romila Thapar, it started on D.N. Jha, it started on uh, uh, all those people from the time of the Ayodhya uh, mosque debate. And the attack is the same. What is the nature of evidence? How do you go from evidence to a statement? What is evidence-based reasoning? All these issues in which science enters the picture are exactly the same issues that social sciences also confront and where these forces oppose both the social sciences and us by counterposing faith against evidence and accepting faith as against following evidence-based reason. So I think we include the social sciences in our thing. Parallel to this uh, campaign that we are doing, we are also drafting a follow-up resolution or a declaration on scientific temper, uh, which we are hoping to get together and get a new signature on that line to follow the 1981-1986 Palampur resolution. And in our imagination, we should think of that statement as a statement which would be signed by famous bio uh, scientist Partha Pratim Majumta and famous social scientist Romila Thapar and we should think what kind of a statement will these people sign and then draft that uh, statement and that process is uh, going on. I want to close my uh, presentation with two other small aspects which I touched on uh, in my book. Very often in our scientific temper debates and activities in the people science movement. As I said, the battle is against superstition. And if the battle is against superstition, you want to prove that those superstitions are wrong. But in that process, a big question in my mind, and I hope in all our minds should be, are we then questioning the people my question, people are falling prey to superstitions for a variety of reasons. Society is backward, therefore there are uh, superstitions. We start questioning each person. It is like saying, you are a fool because you are superstitious. I am the superior person equipped with scientific temper. And I will come and tell you that you are superstitious and you should not be superstitious. You should uh, avoid that. Examples abound in society and in the world. The US is supposed to be 
one of the most advanced uh, countries uh, in the world. There are states in uh, the US where teaching of Darwin in schools is not allowed because the belief is that Darwin violates the principle of creationism which is given in the Bible that God created the universe in one day, six days and on the seventh day he rested. So how can you say evolution and all came up? That is on one side. On the other side, society is full of superstitions. In a large number of hotels in the US, they don't have a 13th floor. You go inside the elevator, you have 12th floor and 14th floor because 13 is unlucky uh, number. People will not walk under a, a ladder. People get scared if a black cat crosses. All kinds of superstitions uh, are there. Even in China today, even if you go to leading government programs or ruling party programs, if you are given a gift, it will be wrapped in red paper because red is believed to be a good luck. It will always come wrapped in red paper. Why not yellow? Why not blue? Why not green? Because it's there. So superstition takes many forms. Uh, to my mind, it is not the major obstacle confronting us today. Society is not backward because people are not backward. Society is backward because there are political economic forces making them backward. You, the average artisan, craftsman, farmer, he's completely rational human being. He plants his crop when he knows the rain is going to come. He harvests the crop when his plants are uh, ripe. He knows which seed to plant. The potter has been making clay pots for thousand years without understanding ceramics, but knowing how he should make the clay and how he should fire it to 800 degrees uh, Celsius. We have the famous Ashokan pillar standing outside Kutub Minar in Delhi, which has stood under rain and sun for close to 2000 years and is not rusted because our artisans knew how to make that uh, science. The problem in India is, and not just India, in most countries in India even more sharply, that the artisans who had the technical skills and the scholars who had intellectual skills never worked together. In fact, that is true in all societies, except partly in the Middle East, because Islam came forward as a more democratizing religion, where people were expected to pray together, live together, uh, commune together. There was some interaction between scholars and uh, artisans. So you got new industries like in chemicals, distillation, etc. coming up where intellectual inputs went in. But nothing like what happened during the Industrial Revolution in Europe. I was just reading Irfan Habib's uh, history of technology in medieval India, 650 up to the Mughal uh, period. And he describes how mining was such a big major industry in India, mining of diamonds, mining of gold, mining of silver, uh, etc. But mining at some point came to a stop because they encountered a problem. They couldn't go deep because they would hit subsoil water water would accumulate, how to get the water out. You used to have people with buckets and going up ladders, you can't keep doing that. Same problem was there in Europe, which depended on coal. When they hit that problem, by that time, the industrial revolution had started. And for the first time, scientists came forward with the idea of a vacuum and an understanding of latent heat, that steam contained more energy than water and use these two principles to work along with an artisan, Stevenson and James Watt. They worked together to produce the first steam engine, which was deployed in the mines, which could then pump out the water by which you could then mine coal in large quantities. And the coal was then burned to run steam engines, to run engines for factories. And that's how the industrial revolution uh, took place. The same with iron smelting in India. Quality was very good, but it was done at household scale by the artisan. When we, was, we were exporting iron 
to England. But when the Industrial Revolution took off there, their blast furnaces could make a big powerful blast because their air blast was powered by a steam engine behind. Our poor blacksmiths were still working with bellows and there was a limit to how much blast they can create. So we could not make steel or iron in the same volume that the British did. Then they started selling steel back to us from the iron they took from us. So it was science and technology that made the difference. While we have unfortunately kept our artisan classes on one side and our intellectual classes uh, on the other. The same 7% drop I said about uh, GDP in R&D is mirrored in the lack of technical knowledge that we provide to our artisans and our workers. You take the annual report of any large industrialist in the country, you will find two problems are highlighted. Lack of infrastructure and lack of skilled manpower. You'll be surprised, you think our India has got so much labor, surplus labor, but they are not skilled. Do you know, 88% of Indian workers have received no formal training whatsoever compared to 65% in the US, 80% in Europe, 90% in Taiwan, Korea, and now 70% in China, which is coming up. Here, we have received no training. You will still find an electrician, you call him to fix a PA system. Here, at least you got a plug. I have seen most places, the electrician will come, he will take the wire, cut it, put two naked wires into the thing, put two matchsticks inside and start off your PA system. Everybody is happy. They think his job is done, but he has no skill. When I was a young student in England, I was, uh, that was about 50 years ago, I went for my first haircut and the chap gave me a very good haircut and that it looked very skilled. So I was very curious, I asked him, I said, have you undergone formal training? He said, yes sir. He pointed to a diploma behind him on the wall. Six months training in hairdressing, which included chemistry, understanding of hair, what soaps and shampoos will work with what kind of hair. He says, if I don't have that diploma, I don't get a license to practice. In our country, we have kept these two streams apart. The artisan and the scholar. The engineer at IIT does not know how to open a machine. And the artisan is doing things, but he does not understand science. It's what I have described in some of my writing as the distinction that we have made between the Shastri and the Mistri. The Mistri has no Gyan and the Gyani has no Hunar, has no skill uh, to do this work. And this is going to hold us back. Not just today, other countries will march forward unless we dismantle this thing. And this, I believe, is also a very important part of the scientific technology. I want to give you a small example. Uh, you know the firm uh, IKEA? The furniture assembler. They've got a big factory outside Hyderabad, well known in Europe. They don't sell you a chair or a table. They sell you a kit which you have to take home and assemble. In India, they know no middle class family will they will see that and they don't know what to do. They will probably also consider it a big insult that I am being asked to uh, do some work. Uh, First thing he will do is to ring up his local carpenter or uh, whatever and call. So IKEA has come up with an idea unique in their whole worldwide operations. Just in India, when you buy a product from IKEA, he will send it to you along with a mechanic from Urban Clap who will come to you and assemble the thing in your home and go because he knows the middle class uh, in India. So that's last point I want to touch on is on religion. I came to this last because I know it's controversial. I'll say this last and all previous things will get forgotten in the discussions to follow. But I will still mention it to the last. I believe the scientific temper discussion has nothing to do with religion. And in my discussions with scientific temper amongst the people, I don't touch religion as a subject. And the reason for that is, philosophically, I believe 
religion and science are what philosophers of science call incommensurables. Incommensurable means science uses terms which are not understood by religion. And religion uses terms which are not understood in science. They belong to two different worlds. You can't make a comparison. See, for example, you ask a question, science will answer, is there a God? And science will demand, show me the proof that there is God. And the person who believes in God will answer, by definition, God is that which cannot be seen, which cannot be heard, which cannot be measured, which cannot be x-rayed, which cannot... So how will you prove the existence of God? Can't you? So the two religions, the two spheres are what I call incommensurables. And I approach people with the idea, you have your faith, that's your... Uh, my only thing comes in where, if in defense of your faith, you quote science, if suppose that person says, it is my belief that the shoal of stones between Alaymanar and Sri Lanka were built by Ravana, by Rama and his Vanara Sena, uh, I will ask for proof. I will not accept faith. Because there you are quoting something practical, which I can measure. Similarly, if there are social evils, dowry, sati, widow remarriage, practices during menstruation of women, which people can give religious color to, but which may not have, there I can enter the picture. But if it is your faith, I have no problem with that. People adversely commented when Chairman Isro, the day before Chandrayaan 3 launch, he went and offered prayer in some temple. I said, I don't have any problem. He's an individual man, he wants to do it. If he had gone to his prayer room inside his house, he would have not even known about it. Let him do it, that's his uh, thing. If it gives him peace of mind, uh, that's okay. He has still done all the calculations necessary. My problem came when he said, no, ancient Indian mathematics said more than, that's a different matter, I will enter into an argument. Two small examples I'll give about this and I'll uh, about religion and science. Why? One example is, 1981 census, enumerator came to my house and asked the usual uh, question, name, name, etc. And then he asked religion. So I said, I'm sorry, I don't have religion. So in Hindi, he said, nahin, nahin, ye kaise ho sakta hai? How can this be? Everybody has religion. Some religion you must have. So I said, no, I don't have religion. I don't practice religion. I don't believe in religion. Sir, please tell me something. Otherwise, my form will be incomplete. I will lose my job. Please tell me something. I said, you know, Jawaharlal Nehru had said, there should be a column here which says none under religion. You don't have that column. Why don't you have that column? He said, no, yes, sir, it is not there. Tell me something. So I said, okay, you write Nastik. Nastik is, uh, you know, Nastika. So I said, write Nastik. He said, oh, Nastika, Hindu. You know. <laughs> so the issue is, even inside religion, there is a room for Nastika. So what are you going to do? Who are you going to oppose? You know, what Shankara used to be called, Adi Shankara used to be called Nastika. He used to be called Shunyavadi. Uh, it is a term used for Buddhists as well as for Adi uh, Shankara. So my thing is, don't get into that. I'll give you an even better example. I had an aunt in Chennai who was a devotee of uh, Sai Baba. Not Shirdi uh, Baba, but Puttaparthi Baba with the, with the big hair. And uh, those you know uh, of him know that all his devotees have a photograph at the house and they will, they say every morning some vibhuti or kumkumam or something appears from there and we have it around. So I had gone to Chennai for a holiday. So I told my aunt, I said, what auntie, this is a thing, you all, you believe in all this. She said, of course, I get vibhuti every morning, I apply. So I said, okay, I will sit tonight in front of the picture. I will stay awake all night and let us see if the vibhuti appears. Uh, so I stayed awake all night and of course no vibhuti uh, appeared. So next morning she came down for her morning coffee and she said, Prabhu, so 
What happened? I said, until you see, please see, there is no vibhuti there. So now, how do you explain it? Of course, there is no vibhuti. With an atheist like you sitting in front, how will that vibhuti happen? So what I, why I am saying this is, religion can be without proof. There is no science without proof and evidence. Religion can exist happily without evidence. They don't need evidence, they don't need proof, they don't need, and it is uh, proof against argument. Any argument you give, there is an available counter argument to say, yes, this is my faith. So at that level, to my mind, I leave that alone to the extent like I leave some superstitions alone. And I'll conclude with my last example. Uh, there used to be this uh, famous batsman in India. Some of you are my generation, you'll remember him called Jimmy Amarnath, Mohinder Amarnath. And he always used to go to bat with a red handkerchief in his back pocket. You could see him when he was walking to bat, he had that red handkerchief poking out. He was asked once, he said, no, it is my superstition. I always carry that, I believe it is good enough. There are many basketball stars in the US who are believed to have worn the same pair of socks for 20 years, believing that it is superstition, it's good luck. Uh, Sunil, uh, this uh, Sachin Tendulkar used to go to bat with the same bat. He used to put tape and band-aid and scotch tape and whatnot, but he will go with that same bat and all this because it was a good luck. Exact opposite was Nawab of Patauri. Who it was famous, he would be sitting inside the pavilion having a sort of nap, and then he'll be told, Pat, it's your turn to bat. So he'll get up and walk out the door, pick up the first bat that he found near the door and go. He didn't have superstition, but he batted well. Tendulkar has superstition, he bats well. Superstition, religion, is a lot about personal psychological satisfaction. I think I have no business interfering with that. If it gives you peace of mind, go ahead. Who am I to disturb your peace of mind and say, don't wear the thing. Why are you wearing a red cloth behind you? Do it. If a child has prepared for the exams fully and still before going to uh, the exam in the morning, he goes to his puja room and prays there and puts a little, go. It gives him peace of mind to do that, go. As you grow older, things may change. Society changes, superstitions change, practices change in society. There was a time when everybody was finicky. Am I eating in front of that fellow? Am I eating in front of that fellow? What is his caste? What is my caste? You turn your back and do all kinds of things. Today you go to a railway station or a railway train. People are eating all over the place on the platform. Nobody is asking whose jat are you, what caste are you. Society changes, practices will change. The important thing to remember is society in India is not backward because people are backward. Please let us not make that mistake. Society is backward because there are big political economic forces making society. Everybody in our society is a rational uh, human being. There is as much superstition among the educated upper middle class as there is among the uneducated lower class. Uh, in the class. There is no big difference. Everybody is superstitious in our country to greater or lesser uh, extent. So once again, let me conclude by saying, friends, I believe today, as I said, our major task and our major effort today is the combat against conscious systematic attempts to dismantle the scientific temper, to attack the idea of science to attack evidence-based reasoning, including by attacking evidence itself. Research itself is being undermined so that you don't have to produce evidence. Do you know the UGC has prepared a list of topics for research in the social sciences focused on governmental programs. So this Avas Yojana, this Ujwala scheme, so they will tell a PhD scholar, you go and research in Uttar Pradesh, in the so-and-so district, how many, uh, how successful it is. And beautifully report, 80% of houses went, they are all very satisfied with Ujwala scheme and government tomorrow will publish that.
So evidence also is now being questioned. Evidence-based reasoning is being questioned. And pluralism is being questioned. Criticism is being questioned. Critical thinking is just being questioned. I've just come from Delhi where several friends of mine associated with this news portal called NewsClick uh, are under attack. They are in jail with all kinds of uh, UAPA and terrorism cases against them. The FIR makes very interesting reading. There are three things in the FIR which are there. The first is, writings in NewsClick have supported the farmer struggle which had dismantled the country and blocked the roads and prevented the government from implementing its programs. Who has not criticized the farmer uh, issue and who has not supported the farmer's struggle? Leading agricultural scientists and economists have done that. The FIR also mentions that during COVID time, NewsClick contained a lot of articles criticizing the government's policy on COVID and undermining the government's efforts. We were signatories to many statements. Science writers writing in NewsClick, including me, have written about the famous Covaxin case, how third phase trials were not published, how that was undermining our own pharmaceutical industry. Far from attacking it, we said, we support the pharmaceutical industry, but wanted that third phase trial should be conducted. All these are efforts by honest scientists to put forward evidence-based reasoning. And these become reasons for putting terrorism charges against you. So I think the problem today of scientific temper is a systemic problem, goes to the roots of scientific temper. Not just formal science. It's not about scientific knowledge. And it is not about superstitions. It is about the way you think. It is about the way you analyze. It is about the way you understand society, you understand science, you understand technology, and you understand the direction in which our country is going. And above all, it involves you and me having the freedom to express our opinion because without that, no science in this country can progress. Thank you very much.